Um, welcome to Frog Friends of Unamagi. My name is Cass Harris and I'm a summer intern this year with NSCN. Um, I'm graduating from CBU in September with a Bachelor of Arts in Science and Environment and I'm hoping to pursue a career in the nonprofit sector. Um, NSCN is an environmental network that strives to support, strengthen, and promote the environmental work of our members by connecting them to each other, to government, and to the public. We currently have a membership of 40 environmental organizations whose common purpose is to conserve and enhance the natural environment and build a sustainable future for Nova Scotia. Um, so a little bit about our speakers tonight. Um, they're from AVCAP Cape Breton, which is an environmental nonprofit that offers the knowledge that Cape Bretoners need to make greener choices. They work directly on practical solutions that help protect and restore our natural environment. Since its beginning in 1992, ACAP has evolved into a dynamic group that integrates environmental, social, and economic factors into projects focusing on action, education, and ecosystem planning. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kathleen. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, Cass, and thanks to Dylan and Ensen for this invitation to join you in co-hosting this. Um, my name is Kathleen Aikens, um, and I am the executive director of ACAP Cape Breton. Tonight, I have the pleasure of doing the intro and the outro to this work while my team from ACAP actually does the heavy lifting of the work um, because this is the kind of thing that they do every day. Um, we're really looking forward to talking about some of our favorite friends, which are frogs. Uh, we'll be talking about why we think our relationships to frogs are pretty important, why they make some great citizen science uh, creatures, and also what their connection is to habitat restoration and climate change adaptation here in Unamagi, Cape Breton. So, I'm going to make sure that the slides, there we go. Okay, so what I would like to start with here is a land acknowledgement and acknowledge our team here is joining from Unamagi, which is also known as Cape Breton. And as an organization that's committed to environmental protection, for us, land acknowledgements are deeply important. And tonight, um, we're coming here with you all virtually as an environmental organization, as a non-Indigenous led organization. And for us, the values that we really want to center are firstly, humility, to recognize the limits of our own knowledge and expertise, to recognize that we're continually learning, including trying to learn through two-eyed seeing approaches, we also want to center the concept of responsibility, that we have responsibility to this land and to all human and non-human living creatures that share it with us, including frogs and all the other animals that frogs are in relationship with. And then finally, we want to recognize that Unamagi is unceded Mi'kmaq territory just as all territory in Canada or Turtle Island or whatever you choose to call it is unceded Indigenous territory and we all have responsibilities for that including future responsibilities of land return. So I'm going to talk just a tiny bit about ACAP in case you aren't familiar with us. Um, we work in the environmental sphere. A big part of this work is environmental education, public education through creative artwork, through getting kids outdoors, whether through schools or community groups, um, going on watershed walks. Th these are the kind of things we really enjoy. We also do habitat restoration work in streams, as you can he see here in one of the pictures, as well as planting native plant species. Uh, we do some wetland restoration and forest restoration as well. And then finally, ecological monitoring. Here are some shots from an annual monitoring activity we do on the Bredore Lakes, as well as forest monitoring that we undertake in our source water drinking sheds in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. And then I'm gonna go back to the frogs before I hand it over to our next team members. And um, frogs are uh, 
a, certainly a critical species worldwide. Depending on how you split or you lump them, there may be between 5,000 to 7,500 described species of frog around the world. And nearly a third of these species are worldwide labeled as critical or threatened. And here we wanted to share um, that the Mi'kmaq word for frog is actually a word that mimics the sound of a frog, which is squelch. And when we started much of the work that we'll, we'll be talking about tonight, it was actually squelchulagos or frog's croaking time, which is from the beginning of May to beginning of June, um, that moon time. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to our first team member from ACAP, who is going to be presenting about the frog species here in Nova Scotia and also some more of her background from frog monitoring. Meg, I'm handing it over to you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Megan Fortune, and I'm the Ecological Monitoring Lead at ACAP Cape Breton. Um, this is our first year monitoring frogs at ACAP, so I am by no means a frog expert, but I'm going to try and share a little bit about the species we have here in Nova Scotia, um, when and where you're most likely to see or hear frogs, why we're monitoring frogs, and I'll touch a little bit about frog populations in the last few years. So before I introduce what species we're looking at tonight um, and talk a little bit about each one, we wanted to do a little poll with you to see if you recognize their calls. I'll let Kathleen set that up. I believe it's Rachel actually. Oh. Can everybody hear the frog the species? I can't hear it right now. Yeah, I don't hear any, any noise. I see the photos and I do have the poll up right now. Um, and it looks like we have two, two answers to spring peeper. So it doesn't sound like there's any, any sound right now. So maybe they're just going off the photo, one of the photos. I'm having trouble getting the sound to work. Oh, I'm. Oh, technical difficulties. Thanks, Rachel. We actually ran through this earlier in the mm -hmm. day and the sound sounded pretty good. Can you hear me talking? Yep. Okay, so. And you couldn't, could you hear that? Um, I didn't hear it, Rachel, but I know that sometimes when I've had presentations in class, um, there's some sort of setting you have to change to share your sound from your computer to us. Um, so it might be somewhere in settings or something like that. Okay. Well, thanks for bearing with us, folks. I think we'll move on, Rachel, and I. we should have figured out the settings yeah, from the co-hosting thing. Okay, so we're gonna share the results and thanks for your patience on that. The sound that we were going to play for you is one that Meg will, will bring up and talk about next. Yes, so that was supposed to be an American toad. <laughs> um, we had also planned on playing the calls in the background as I introduce each species, but I may have happen. gotten it. Can you hear? I'll try one last time. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we'll move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good effort, it's good effort. Yeah, <laughs> I get no soundtrack this time. 
Um, so first we have the American toad. Uh, this toad has reddish brown or olive skin and sometimes has a light go line going down the middle of their back. Um, one of the ways you can tell it apart from other toads is it has these long glands um, known as the parotid glands and they don't reach all the way to its cranial crests. So that's a good way to tell it apart from other toads. Um, this toad is pretty widespread throughout Eastern Canada, ranging from central Manitoba all the way over to Labrador. And you'll find it in a wide variety of terrestrial habitats like gardens and mown grass or in the forest. They're only found in the water during breeding season and as larvae. So their breeding season is typically from late March to early June. Um, and that depends on how far north they are and they breed in warm, shallow ponds, streams, or sometimes even large puddles or ditches. Um, both the tadpoles and the adult toads have poison glands in their skin, which reduces their susceptibility to predators. And the next slide there. Okay, so next up we have spring peepers. Uh, spring peepers are typical typical tree frogs in that they're small and they have enlarged toe pads. Um, they vary in color from tan to gray. And I don't know if you can tell by these pictures, but they have a dark X mark on their back, um, which is usually how they can be distinguished from other tree frogs. Their call is the earliest that's heard in the spring, and they and their call can carry over half a kilometer, so it's pretty loud. Um, and they can also sometimes be heard calling in the fall. However, that doesn't lead to breeding. Their, own, their breeding season is only in the spring and early summer. Um, they're found mainly in Eastern North America, ranging from Manitoba to Nova Scotia. And they're also found as far south as Florida. They're also found in a wide variety of habitats and breed basically almost anywhere that there's water, although they're more often found in woodland ponds. And these frogs are actually highly susceptible to extensive urbanization. For example, populations in Toronto have basically completely disappeared due to urbanization and loss of their habitat. Here we have bullfrogs, which are my new favorite frog. <laughs> Um, they are the largest frogs in North America, and their tadpoles also grow larger than other species. They vary from pale green to dark green or brown. They have these large tympanum that is always bigger than their eye, and they're sometimes confused with green frogs. However, however bullfrogs lack the two uh, dorsal lateral ridges that green frogs have. They are native to the deciduous forests of Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. And they're also found in the lower mainland of British Columbia and on Vancouver Island. However, they were introduced and there are now actually too many frogs there, which is resulting in the decline of other frog species because bullfrogs actually eat smaller frogs. Um, you can find bullfrogs around large permanent bodies of water, although sometimes they may spend part of the summer in smaller ponds. And they also hibernate in large deep ponds and lakes and rivers. And then next one there, there we go. So here we have mink frogs. These frogs range from olive to brown in color and can have spots or molting on their sides and legs. You can see this guy, these guys have some molting. Um, they've got a large tympanum and their eyes are slightly upturned and they actually got their name mink frog from their musky and pungent odor. Um, they're a, they are a northern species and can be found in Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and also Labrador and they are highly aquatic and they're actually rarely found on land. They prefer large, cold, permanent ponds and lakes. And they breed during the late spring through to midsummer and their calls can be heard most intensely right before dawn. Next we have leopard frogs. So they can be green or brown and they have large light edged spots. 
They're found in every province and territory in Canada, with the exception of the Yukon. Like other frogs we've talked about, they have a wide range of habitats from prairies to woodlands to tundra, and they also often they're also often found large distances from open water. Um, leopard frogs have dramatically declined in the last few decades, with a population almost completely disappearing in Manitoba in the 1970s. Um, populations have also declined in Alberta and Northern Ontario. Although the populations have been in a decline, they appear to be stabilizing now, and in some areas their populations are actually increasing. And it's thought that the declines are due to habitat loss and long-term drought, although that's not confirmed. Next, we, oh, back one. There we go. Next, we have green frogs, which are also known as true frogs. Um, they can be green, brown, bronze, or they can be a combination of those colors. They have also large distinct tympanum and very prominent dorsal lateral ridges. However, their ridges only run partway down their back and don't actually meet their groin. Um, they are native to, I bet you're sensing a trend here, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and PEI, and they were introduced to Newfoundland and British Columbia. Um, they're commonly found in or near shallow permanent waters like swamps, lake edges, ponds, or springs, and they begin calling in late spring and may breed as late as August. Uh, wood frogs can be reddish, tan, or dark brown, and they have a dark mask that you can see here that ends right behind the tympanum. Um, they're also found in every province and territory in Canada, making them the most widely distributed uh, amphibian in Canada. They are the earliest breeders in most of their areas, and sometimes begin calling when there's actually still ice on the ponds in spring. Um, they're mostly found in moist wetlands and vernal woodland pools, although they can be found in more extreme areas like the tund tundras in the north and grasslands in the west. Um, they're also freeze intolerant, so they hibernate under logs or uh, leaf litter in the forest floor. And they can actually change their color from dark to light, so they'll darken their color when they're cold in order to absorb more heat. And lastly, we have pickerel frogs. So pickerel frogs are also known as true frogs. They have smooth tan skin and yellow dorsal lateral ridges. They have parallel rows of dark square spots down their back, which is actually what distinguishes them from other frog species. Um, they are found throughout much of Eastern Canada, including Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. They also prefer ponds and streams with stable temperatures. Um, so they like springs and cold seepages. In the United States, they were actually found in some caves and they spend part of the summer foraging in fields and meadows. So when and where are the best places to find frogs? The breeding season for most frogs is from late spring to midsummer. At ACAP, we started our monitoring in late March and surveyed once a month every month um, with one final survey left for July. So the best time to hear frog calls is during the night, usually between sunset and midnight. They will likely be more active. Um, they'll also be more active with temperatures of 5 to 17, 17 degrees. Um, if it's too hot or too cold, they won't be out as much, which will make hearing their calls and monitoring more difficult. And with over 5,000 known species of frogs, they're found in a very wide variety of habitats, from frozen tundras to tropical forests to deserts. Um, but because their skin requires fresh water, frogs are typically found in aquatic and swampy areas, although, of course, there are some exceptions out there. So why are we monitoring frogs? 
We are monitoring frogs because they're good bioindicators, meaning the presence or absence of frogs in an area can help determine the health of that ecosystem. Um, so population declines in an area could be an indication that that, that particular ecosystem may be out of balance. Um, frogs breathe partly through their skin, which is constantly exposed to their environment. Therefore, their bodies are more sensitive to environmental factors. Uh, Rachel will go into more details on this in a little bit, but just to quickly name a few, um, some of the environmental factors that they're most sensitive to are disease, pollutants, UV radiation, and habitat destruction. So where have the frogs gone and what's happened to cause population declines? Um, again, Rachel will touch on this in a little bit more depth, but it's been found that significant population declines or even extinctions due to increasing disease outbreaks, climate change, invasive species, and loss of habitat. Uh, studies found that amphibian populations are actually declining at a rate of 3.7% per year although the rate may be more severe in some regions. And it's estimated that 200 species of frogs have gone extinct since 1970. So I'm going to hand it over to Rachel now, and she's gonna talk more about frogs in the environment. Hello, uh, my name is Rachel. I'm an ecological monitoring intern with ACAP. Uh, I am also new to frog monitoring uh, th this year, but uh, I've been involved in several projects with ACAP, one of which I'll touch on tonight, and also doing some frog monitoring with my lovely colleagues. Uh, so we've talked about the different species of frogs in Nova Scotia, the fact that their populations are declining. I'm going to talk more about what affects these little creatures, potential impacts of climate change, and I'm also going to talk about an ecological ecological restoration project we're working on where we're using frog monitoring. So as Meg mentioned, frogs can be excellent bioindicators. They spend part of their lives in the water and part on land, and they also breathe partly through their skin. Because of this, they're very sensitive to changes in the environment. This is concerning because frogs are pretty awesome. Uh, aside from their value as bioindicators, their tadpole stage eats algae, which can help regulate al algal blooms, and adult frogs help control insect populations. Generally, these are things in the environment that can affect frogs. Pollutants, uh, like we mentioned, frogs breathe partly through their skin and also through their gills as juveniles. So they're breathing any pollutants in the water constantly. They don't have a huge capacity for detoxifying chemicals and it's very energy intensive. And exposure to pollutants can cause reduced body mass and size, limb and organ deformities. Something like UV radiation, especially UV radiation can cause, or UVB radiation can cause mortality and deformities. This is concerning with any changes in the ozone layer and also due to climate change, which I'll talk about next, how it's affecting weather pat patterns. Loss of habitat is also significant to frogs, whether it be dried out ponds and wetlands or purposeful human development. And frogs, like Meg mentioned as well, are also susceptible to disease. So all the things I mentioned on the previous slide can be influenced by climate change. Changing weather patterns can change when it rains, which is important for frog breeding habitats. With less snow as well, we get less snow melt in the spring, which lessens the standing water available as well for, for breeding and general habitat. Increasing average temperatures and drought are also concerning because high temperatures can directly cause mortality, but also uh, it can change their breeding and met metamorphos metamorphosis stages. And finally, climate change or with climate change, increase in disease is also common since the disease can survive and spread further than it otherwise might. An example of a pollutant that affects frogs that may not immediately come to mind is road salt, uh, which is also tied into climate change. 
Uh, we use a lot of salt as de-icing material in Canada, about 5 million tons on the roads every year. Um, especially now as we have a lot of freezing and thawing cycles due to climate change. So other effects besides direct mortality from high salinity, uh, high chloride concentrations in runoff, in road runoff can lower species richness in roadside ponds. And that effect can also extend at least 50 meters into the adjacent forest. Larval exposure to chloride can also lengthen the larval stage, meaning that ponds could dry out as they normally do, but before metamorphosis and before the, the frogs can tolerate being dried out before they develop their lungs. So now I'm gonna pivot a bit and talk about how ACAP is incorporating frog monitoring into one of our restoration projects. As many of you might know, the uh, south end of Sydney experiences quite regular flooding, which has been affecting people's homes and properties for decades. The south end of Sydney is adjacent to the Wash Brook, which, which you can see flowing in this aerial photo. Uh, rivers, and, oh, sorry, it's adjacent to the Wash Brook. It, the south end of Sydney is a floodplain and rivers and stream naturally flood during large rain events. And this can be a positive thing when it's not affecting people's homes. Water escaping the river can replenish groundwater stores and help replenish soil nutrients, develop, developing more healthy soil. Healthy streams and rivers are actually able to absorb lots of storm water and hold it in the ground and release it slowly. And when it can't help by doing that, storm water instead runs along the pavement where it can overwhelm the storm water infrastructure and also accumulate in housing areas, which is where we see a lot of flood damage. Healthy streams and rivers absorb stormwater really well when they have healthy riparian zones and are near healthy wetlands. Riparian zones are areas surrounding streams and rivers that are filled with moisture loving vegetation, and they act as a buffer between aquatic habitats and dry upland areas. And a healthy riparian zone has lot of, lots of native vegetation. It may have some wetland areas, lots of different species of native plants. In the Washbrook, however, uh, the, the riparian zone is not what you would, you would consider healthy. Uh, human development has really affected the area. You can see, uh, actually, can you go back a slide? Uh, you can see in the map photo along the riparian zone, the kind of bushy area along the river. It's not very big. Uh, and in some areas, it's non it's non-existent. Um, it's also comprised of a lot of invasive uh, species populations. Native plants tend to root very deeply, often deeper than invasive plants, and uh, those deep roots are really what we want to help absorb and help infiltrate that storm water where it can be stored safely in the ground. Also, something to note uh, is that. One might look at this aerial photo and think uh, that it's not too bad. We have lots of green in the area, uh, but much of this green is actually mowed grass, which doesn't add much to the, the water holding capacity of the floodplain. Uh, and next slide now. Here's a, a more visual example of the difference between a healthy and a healthy and, and unhealthy riparian zone. On the left, there's lots of lush plants, a good width, with the zone on the right, there's not really much vegetation at all. We see a lot of mowed grass. Uh, you could see some bank collapse, which is actually happening along some parts of the Washbrook. And uh, frogs have been here heard in this area of Sydney for many, many years ago. Um, the fact that the river can't absorb as much storm water and the fact that frogs are not in a place where we would expect them to be in the, this wet area, uh, it tells us that something's wrong with the ecosystem. So uh, another way to illustrate the changes to the Washbrook over the years, uh, this is a map made by our lovely ecological technician, Jules, who you'll we'll hear from next to talking about citizen science and iNaturalist. Uh, the yellow lines in this map is the current extent of the Washbrook. It's really thin and narrow and pretty straight in some sections but the red outline shows us the extent of the Washbrook in the 1930s. The river was a lot wider. It could hold a lot more water. Surrounding vegetation and wetland habitat was, would also be good for, good for frogs. 
our development has really changed the washbook. And uh, this map only dates back to uh, the 1930s though, when there was already some development going on. Uh, so this is the extent of the brook even after some industrial impact. Uh, there was a lot of other impact to this area as well. Closer to the, the water, there was a Mi'kmaq population dis displaced. So the downtown Sydney changed, changed a lot due to human development. And next slide. So at ACAP, we're working on a project to restore the riparian zone of the stream in some locations. So this is the area we're focusing on in this map photo. There are some areas that are pretty damp uh, and support cattails, wetland areas. Some of the areas around the wash book um, could be wetlands, which are perfect ha frog habitat. Um, but in the beginning of our monitoring surveys, um, the sites of which are highlighted by the little, the little white frogs in the, in the map photo, um, we found no auditory evidence of frogs living in that area, a place where they, they kind of should be. Um, we heard a couple frog calls in the area with the frog on the right, um, but they are really distant, only a couple and uh, so not in the immediate area and we, we haven't heard them again since we've been back. Um, so right now frogs are, are part of the chorus we're hearing and seeing that is telling us that the Washbrook uh, isn't doing so great right now. Um, we're restoring the area by slowly replacing invasive species with native plants. We're helping to conserve wetland areas. We're doing plantings of native species um, and incorporating na nature-based solutions. We're hoping that we will, over the years, start to hear frogs returning to this area, which will tell us we're going in the right direction. And I've been mentioning frog monitoring uh, it might sound something like, or it might sound like something that's kind of hard, but it's actually pretty easy. Uh, we've been monitoring using our ears mostly, listening to the different calls. And we're also using a tool called iNaturalist. And so I'm gonna hand it off to Jules now, who's gonna talk more about iNat. Hi everyone, um, can everyone hear me okay? I just turned my mic on and I'm using a weird headset, so. I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, thanks, Rachel and uh, Meg earlier for um, your segments in the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so um, we all love frogs here. So I'm really glad that we're here tonight to talk about um, our frog friends, as it says here in our project poster. So we started an INAP project back in uh, early April, which is going to continue until mid-July. Uh, which is basically an open citizen science project for us to look into our backyards and our nature areas and see what frog species are in our areas and to learn more about these uh, amphibian friends that we have in our ecosystems. Um, so I'm going to get into explaining that um, next couple of slides. So yeah, so a little quick blurb about me. Um, I'm an ecological technician here at ACAP Cape Breton. I also do a lot of GIS mapping work and uh, spatial analysis uh, with certain habitats and stuff like that. I'm a current master's student at Dalhousie University uh, studying conservation and habitat management of uh, species at risk. I'm going to be graduating soon, which is exciting. I'm a birder and I'm also an amateur nature photographer and I've been using iNaturalist um, for about five years, um, I started using it um, back when I took my undergrad because we did a bio blitz with Cape Breton Highlands National Park. Um, I didn't really get into doing INAT stuff until over the last, I want to say, almost two years. And obviously, that number 3,859 observations, it kind of blew up over the last like year or so because um, INAT's really fun to use. And I'm sure once I explain exactly what INAT is and you will learn a little bit more about it. Um, it becomes really fun to use and almost, um, you know, it, it, it encourages you to go outside more and, and learn more about your neighbors. So let's get into talking about the project. All right, so before we talk about the project, uh, I just want to explain what iNaturalist is. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, iNaturalist is a nature identification app. Um, that was developed by a team of conservation biologists and just nature enthusiasts. So the community is made up of observers, identifiers, and those who just love to go outside. Um, it helps to ID plants, animals, and other organisms. 
You can use it to explore certain locations and look at other uh, data that people have collected. You can also create projects to monitor biodiversity um, and ecosystem dynamics. Um, and it's also user friendly and free to use. And lots of uh, government and NGO and not for profit um, environmental organizations use iNaturalist citizen science data um, to gauge areas of um, interest for species at risk or species that they are monitoring. So what better way um, for us to do our frog mining by having an iNaturalist project so we can share this information with our communities as well as contribute to a growing body of research. So why a project for frogs? So we wanted to do this project because for one, we would be monitoring local frog populations and we'd also be learning the species ID of the uh, species that are native to Unamagi here in Cape Breton. Um, like I said before, know your neighbors. Um, once you know your species, especially like a certain group of species, like for me, for example, I hardly know any plants, but now that I know a good amount of plants, I go out in my backyard and I can name every single plant that's in my backyard and the world feels like a bigger place. So uh, the beauty of knowing species ID is uh, knowing your neighbors and the world gets a teensy bit bigger, um, which I think is pretty fascinating. Um, so this gives us in the project uh, the opportunity to record observations over the spring and summer uh, when frogs are breeding, and that's from April to mid-July, roughly. Um, so this project will also help us gauge for potential sites in the future, since this is our first year doing uh, frog monitoring officially. So from this first year, uh, INAT project, as well as our own monitoring, we can figure out what areas should be a priority for next year's surveys and for years to come, especially investigating amphibian presence near the Washbrook as uh, Rachel spoke about earlier. So that's what makes this project all the more exciting. So Frog Friends of Unamagi, the purpose is to basically document the species diversity and occurrence of frogs uh, within CBRM and by extension, Cape Breton Island, uh, Unamagi. Um, as well as looking at certain watersheds where these uh, species occur. So the project is set from April 1st till July 15th at midnight. Um, and observations can be from any time between those dates. So if you wanna to contribute to the project, photos, videos, and audio clips are welcome. Um, however, you must have an iNaturalist account to join. The project is all ages though. So you can either be a beginner or an expert in frogs or just expert citizen science in general, like you don't have to be um, super into citizen science uh, to join the project. You can be just someone who's starting out and this could be your first project. So anyone who wants to participate uh, can join. So the places, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking at all of Un Unamagi, uh, Cape Breton, um, but that includes the four counties, CBRM, uh, which is Cape Breton Regional Municipality, uh, Richmond, Inverness, and Victoria. So we're also taking a look at certain watersheds um, here in the CBRM, such as Kelly Lake, Middle Lake, McCaskill's Lake, uh, Waterford and Kilkenny, Washbrook, as we mentioned earlier, and Potter Lake. And those are all drinking water sources um, in the CBRM and ACAP has done some monitoring there as well. Um, so this is just a quick little slide to um, describe how you can upload your observations to the project. So for those of you who don't have iNaturalist, uh, you can either go to iNaturalist.ca um, via desktop, or you can download the app on your phone, uh, which is App Store and iPhone or Google Play for Android. So to make an observation, you basically take a photo with your phone, uh, then you upload the photo uh, to iNash, then you select the species because it asks you, what did you see? So for example, if you see uh, a green frog and you're 100% confident it's a green frog, you can just type in green frog and it'll give you the little window to click. You just click that. Um, but if you can't figure out what the species is or if you're not sure, um, let's say for example, you get your green frog confused with an American toad and you're not sure which species it is, you can just click on uh, frogs and toads. So you can kind of have it as like a, uh, the broadest identification you can give so that someone else can come in later and give you the accurate ID because it's a learning experience too right um, and then uh, third you would add your location 
So if you take your photo uh, with your phone, it most likely has the geodata already stored in the image. However, uh, if it's not, just zoom in the map and just click the approximate location where you've seen the organism. And then finally, you submit the uh, observation for review. And then you'll have other people on the uh, iNaturalist community give you feedback. Uh, they'll let you know if they agree with your ID or if they have other suggestions. And it pretty much goes from there. So the next steps. So once you hit submit, your frog observation will be added to the project. So when you first upload it, it'll say it needs ID, which means it's waiting for an ID from other users on iNaturalist. So needs ID, it's basically pending your community review. But once it's research grade, it means that it was reviewed and there's an agreement on the ID of the taxa. So once you reach research grade, you're officially an iNaturalist. Um, so both needs ID and research grade are gonna be included in this project. So if you have a species that doesn't have an ID yet, um, don't fret. Uh, we will get an ID uh, fairly shortly after the project's done because we have a wide array of people in the community who are identifying uh, organisms and observations on the app. So you'll most likely uh, have a clear research grade identification uh, sometime by the end of July, which is also pretty exciting for us because then we get to uh, figure out what the uh, demographics are for our um, uh, end of the project. We can figure out which species are the most occurring and which ones are the least and stuff like that. So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, so just some key things. Because um, I've been doing this for like almost two years straight, like using iNaturalist like crazy, especially working with ACAP. I just use it all the time. Like I'm constantly taking pictures <laughs> and wandering off the beaten trail to like find organisms. Um, so just uh, make sure the date and time are as accurate as possible when you take your um, observation. And also try to make sure your photo captures the full organism. So multiple angles are encouraged. So you can take uh, as many photos as you want. You can upload, I think, up to 20 per observation. Um, so if you are unable to take pictures of the organism, uh, you can also record sound clips. So that using sound clips is something I've only started using recently, but I really love it because I'm a birder, as I mentioned earlier, and birds tend to fly really fast. So if I can't take a picture of a bird, I'll use the uh, sound clip. And the sound clip tool is also really good for frogs because frogs are really loud <laughs> and uh, it works really good for them. So if you're able to take a sound clip, I would suggest uh, just making sure that noise is minimal in the background and just take your surroundings into account um, and just make sure that it's audible. You can also add a description in your observation under notes. So let's say you're in your backyard and you see a big uh, Eastern American toad, you can put found in my backyard in the description, or you could say um, this one jumped on my hand or something, you know what I mean? Like it gives a kind of a personalization almost. And going back to the pictures, um, yeah, try to take as many as possible. This picture on the right is one I took um, when I first started using iNaturalist uh, back in 2017. I was on French Mountain, and this was the only image I could get of a really blurry wood frog before it hopped away. And the only way I could figure out it was a wood frog was because we had a ruler next to it, and the frog was really small. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, just some considerations um, for using iNat. Whether you're looking at frogs, birds, mammals, um, whatever it is that you're observing, um, just take, uh, take into mind, just do not disturb the wildlife. Remember that they are busy foraging, socializing, and taking care of their young. Um, just be courteous, minimize noise, and refrain from getting too close. And if you're unsure of an ID, um, try to identify uh, what you can, and then wait for fellow um, INAC community members to provide second opinions on the taxa. So a good example would be if you see a frog, we don't know what the frog species is. It could either be a leopard frog or a pickerel frog. That's the um, thesis you come up with. Um, so just to be safe, you select the genus Lithobates because it's a genus that en encompasses both of those species. And then someone can come in and give you a second opinion on whether they think it's a, a leopard frog or a pickerel frog. And thank you for listening to my little spiel on iNaturalist. Um, and yeah, thanks for letting me talk about it. And I hope you go home today and open up your desktop or your phone and download the app because it's really great. Um, I love it. 
Uh, can't stress it enough. And the project is going to be open until July 15th. So once you join INAS, you can just type in frog friends in the search bar, click the project, and there should be a join button on desktop. Um, and on the app, it should have a, uh, a join button at the first top window there as well. So thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jules. Jules is our resident um, INAT expert and GIS expert. Um, Megan, who you heard at the very beginning, is our ecological monitoring lead. And uh, Rachel, who spoke in the middle, was ACAP's um, ecological monitoring intern and is doing a fantastic job with that. So if you want to join our project, you look for Frog Friends of Unamagi, which Jules mentioned. We're also available on social media and we'll put some information in the chat. And then we also wanted to just to, to end this time by sharing some of our favorite resources and projects. You might be joining in for somewhere other than Unamagi. If you'd still like to contribute to monitoring frogs and reptiles, in this case, there's the Nova Scotia Herp Atlas online, which is really fantastic um, project of reptiles and amphibians across Nova Scotia. For more information, if you'd like to learn the sounds of all our different frogs, you can go to Frog Watch with a special page about Nova Scotia to listen to the calls of the American toad, um, leopard frog, every, every species we have. And then finally, we always like to promote our friends at UINR, the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources. Um, this, they've got a lot of general resources about um, Mi'kmaq indigenous approaches to ecology and to conservation. So with that, we know that there are um, questions potentially for us. If not, we're happy to just stay around and chat with anyone who wants to talk about frogs. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can actually see uh, some other human faces. Thank you all for joining us here tonight. And thanks again to the Nova Scotia Environmental Network for inviting us here. Yeah, so thank you so much, Kathleen, Megan, Rachel, and Julia for being here tonight and hosting such an interesting presentation. So now we'll open up the floor to questions. I have a question, uh, Kathleen. I was just curious, is this the, um, has there any been, has there been any uh, similar research uh, monitoring programs carried out in the CBRM in the past? Is this like a new, um, something new for CBRM? And just curious, if you know at all what the most uh, common species uh, is in Cape Breton of all the frogs. Um, yeah, I can, I probably should hand, hand this over to Megan because she would know better than I, than I. to my knowledge, this is the first coordinated um, frog monitoring program for the CBRM and it's the first in our source water uh, watersheds, which we're trying to do, but, but Megan, you might probably have more information than me. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of any other like coordinated projects, although I'm sure a lot of the monitoring has just been like citizen science stuff. Um, as for the most popular species, I want to say just based off of our monitoring, it would be spring peeper. That seems to be what we hear the most of. Um, we've only heard like a small number of other frog calls other than spring peeper, so, yeah. I, mean, I, oft, I often hear like people say during spring that it's not frog, frogs, it's crickets. What, what do you say to that? It, it's it is indeed frogs. It's yeah. the spring peepers, yeah. Cool. There's another question here, I think from, from Ronald. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. just, just uh, <clears throat> a comment. You mentioned the uh, Nova Scotia Herp Atlas, and I just wanted to, uh, to clarify that if anybody, you can join both projects and uh, your, your sightings can be 
uh, can be picked up by both by both projects. So it's they're not uh, they're not going to be in conflict. So you can there's uh, no problem in joining both projects, and I would encourage you to do so. Excellent. Yeah, we would also promote. And um, one thing I meant to say with that is a shout out to um, an organization on the mainland that folks are probably familiar with, but the MTRI, Mercy Tobiotic Research Institute, who uh, initiated the most recent iteration of that iNaturalist project, they may also have partners. Um, yeah, and I think Rachel said the more data, the better in the chat. Agreed. So with your riparian project, uh, I assume you're working closely with the CBRM on that. Is that on CBRM property? And just curious how things have been going with that as far as uh, relationship building and and what other areas do you have in mind? Because I know there are a few brooks and things. There's one here in Glace Bay particularly that has lost a lot of trees along the banks and things like that. And, and definitely some areas that could use uh, restorations or, do you, or your hopes is your hope to expand these projects in other areas in the CBRM? Yeah, that, that's the hope. Um, the CBRM has actually been a really great partner um, on this, especially the uh, parks department at the CBRM, Parks and Grounds. And they're really interested in integrating more urban tree into the environment because that helps with like climate agitation and flood mitigation and heat island effects, which we're probably gonna have to worry about more. So. Um, yeah, Dylan, if you have, have um, sites and ideas to going forward in the next couple of years, um, we should chat or put you in touch with some, some folks at the, the CBRM who are looking to expand the urban tree coverage. Great, thanks. I have another question, if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you mentioned some of the disease threats to uh, to frogs. Do you know if a chytrid fungus has been found in Cape Breton? It was found in PEI, but it doesn't appear to be too much of a problem in northern areas. So I'm just wondering if there's any information about it in Cape for Cape Breton. I did do a little bit of research on that before this, actually, and I couldn't find anything of it being found in Cape Breton. Yeah, um, maybe nobody looked for it either. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility yeah. because on PEI was a professor of the, uh, at the vet college who, who started looking at it, uh, ended up not being able to, uh, to get any funding to continue the project. And eventually she, uh, well, she got another job off somewhere else, another university. So. There hasn't been anything in the maritime since, as far as I know. Do you know if she documented any of that, Ronald, or where it would be, uh, where it would be available? Because you write that a lot of times, like we don't even know um, what's out here and we don't discover some pathogen problems until they become major. Uh, there was, a, I don't think there was ever a major like paper published, but there were, uh, there was at least one or maybe a couple of short summaries Okay. Um, written up. Uh, if you go to uh, the PEI Veterinary College website, you okay. may find it, but she has moved on to another university, so it may have been on her specific site. Right. Uh, what was her name? It was a Spanish name. That doesn't help much. <laughs> <laughs> we can try Googling for the, the fungus and the veterinary college on, on um, a couple academic websites and we might be able to pull it up. That's really good information. Yeah, but I, think, I think it was a very, uh, uh, like not, uh, it didn't sound like it was a, like a peer reviewed published paper. It was sort of like a quick summary because well, they never got really got it off the ground. Mm -hmm. So it might, it may have been associated with, with, you know, with her website. And now that she's moved on, she may have, UPI might have taken it down. Mm. Hopefully there's some record somewhere. Hopefully I haven't looked for it in a long time, so. Oh, and Rachel's, I think Rachel, you put this in the chat. And oh yeah, I, sent, I direct sent it to you. You direct I, sent it to me, but I, 
think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Mar Maria For Forzan? Yes, that is that uh, Maria Forzan. Yes, that's correct. Awesome. Okay, I'm just gonna. There we go. Any other questions? I was curious about a few things that you mentioned. Uh, I believe you mentioned that the peeper was the first one heard in the spring. That is not correct. It, it is the wood frog. It is the wood frog that it often calls around here. Yeah. However, uh, I used to go looking for frogs every night, every spring from early, from mm -hmm. first ice out until mid to late June. Uh, wood frog was always first. There was never, ever any exception. However, there are two things that happen. Uh, one is that frog, uh, ponds do not have the same uh, temperature regime. So one pond can be quite a bit earlier than the, than the next. So I say the wood frog is always first when you consider one pond. If you compare one pond to the next, not necessarily because one pond could be a week or more, even more earlier than the other. So obviously in the early pond, the spring, the spring peepers would be earlier than the wood frogs in the late pond. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the wood frog call doesn't sound, that doesn't carry very far, but the peeper does. So if you, if you don't go right next to the pond, you might get the impression, you know, a lot of people will have the impression that the wood, that the peeper is first, but that's a misleading, uh, that's uh, the effect of the, how far the sound carries for the, for the two species. Yeah, that's very true. It probably is more accurate to say that it's often the first detected uh, call, oh, yeah. but it's definitely, we are, um, on the on the hunt sounds wrong because it, it sounds like we're capturing them but for more wood frogs i think that they are um i haven't taken a look at how many have shown up in our project but just in terms of sheer numbers and how overpowering the peepers are when they're out oh yeah. there's no doubt about that they can be deafening if you go in the in a full chorus yep and the, they last a lot longer than uh, than the wood frogs. The wood frogs are over very you know very quickly. Mm -hmm. So people will notice the spring peepers a lot more than the wood frogs. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody knows what a, you know the sound of the spring peeper, but a lot of people have no idea when you're talking about wood frogs. So. Yeah, and I, I know some people might have to leave her at eight, but I'm cur I am uh, I do have a question for you that I'll ask in a moment, Ronald, but I want to open up just in case there are any other questions before people have to go. Um, and if there's not questions, we appreciate you all so much for joining us here. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you everyone for attending tonight. Um, if you're interested in staying connected with NSEN to hear about any future events or initiatives, um, you can subscribe to our newsletter, which Dylan is going to put in the chat. And thanks again to ACAP for hosting such an interesting presentation. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, Cass and Dylan. <laughs>